this panel so that it's as interactive as possible so please do participate ask questions share your thoughts um, if you'd like to tweet we've got the hashtag um, uh, CGD talks and add us at the GFF or at CGD development so um, again thanks very much for being here I will go straight into uh, the first presenter uh, Dr. Miriam Chisholm who is the uh, of the GFF who's going to give us an overview of, uh, of the vision and achievements so far, the challenges perhaps, and then we'll move on to uh, Dr. Jibril who will give a much more localised uh, perspective. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So thank you so much uh, for that introduction and thanks to all of you for coming here and thanks to all of you who are joining us uh, virtually for this discussion this afternoon. I must say that this is a moment for us because so many of you partners have been asking about the results. So here we are to talk about the results and the implications of that. It's also very exciting, and I would love to first start by thanking the Center for Global Development and the Games Foundation. the talk that we're going to focus on today. So to have you here is really very, very exciting to, um, to bring the reality to these discussions and what the challenges are and what you're doing. It's also exciting to have Claire, Joe and Kevin here because all three of them actually know the, C the GFF model very well and have been in different ways part of shaping it. Uh, Claire was on our uh, investors group in the early two early years of this and uh, of course, Joe and the Gates Foundation of the Investors Group has, has uh, saved, and, and Kevin has been a very important voice. So you all, this table as well as um, in the room here, have in different ways, I think, helped shape where we are today, and we hope a little bit uh, that we will actually talk about how we continue to shape it going forward. So, um, why we are here is, at this particular time, is that we have results. After three years of proof of concept, countries are starting to generate early results. And that's really what I would like to just share in 10 minutes. But it is important, I think, for us to uh, just remember uh, and remind ourselves why the GFF was launched in the first place. It was the recognition at the end of the um, MDG era and the beginning of the SDG era that, in fact, we had an unfinished that the, even though we had made great progress in many areas, there were still six million um, Most countries did not achieve their MMR goals of two-third reductions, and newborn mortality has hardly been touched. So, on the one hand, we knew that there was this huge agenda and something we could do something about. We can eliminate preventable death by 2030. And Innovatively to mobilize the so the recognition that uh, ODA, however much we try to grow that slice of the pie, is, is a very small slice compared to money available through domestic resources and the private private money. So are there ways we could think more innovatively around mobilizing scale and sustainable financing? the financing gap for women, children, and adolescents. That was the impetus. 
Now you hear us in the GFF community often talk about GFF being catalytic. So what do we mean by catalytic? What we mean by catalytic is that the GFF has several levers. One and the most important is to reduce inefficiencies. Here we talk about the prioritization of high impact interventions for women, children and adolescents. Also looking at the priority bottlenecks in the health systems that can help us deliver. But it's also other inefficiencies that I think many of you know of. And that is the fact that countries don't even spend the budget they have. I think about a year ago that about 40% of the budgets allocated for health isn't used. So how can we work with ministries of financing, the budget and the implementers to actually ensure that the money are used and get more value for money, but how do we also grow the slice uh, for, for health and for health uh, of women, children, and adolescents in particular. The other important thing we do in the GFF is support countries to mobilize domestic resources. And uh, what uh, is done in Niger State is a good example of that, and we'll hear a little bit about that. We think the least that has to happen is that government protect the budget they have for health, so that when they get additional inf uh, inflows of financing for health, that doesn't mean that you shift what's on budget for health. So how do we secure budgets, and how do we increase the budgets for health overall, and the high impact investment, the allocative efficiency that you get from investing in women, children, and adolescents health and nutrition. Thirdly, we have a great opportunity right now to link small amount of money to large amount of IDA, IVID, World Bank financing. And when the GFF was launched, there were these claims that, you know, a dollar or a pound put into the GFF would result in four pounds coming out from, from IDA, IVID. And the good news is that, that that ratio is one to seven. One to seven in the first uh, three years in the, in the 16 first country. That's an important link as we think about uh, scale. Fourthly, you all know that there is a huge fragmented field out there of bilateral and multilateral aid. So how do we get those who are present in countries to align their financing around one set of high prioritized uh, interventions and systems bottlenecks? And that's why you hear again and again so much about the investment case. The investment case is that process to get countries to agree on what's very, very difficult, a set of core priorities that are driven by evidence, evidence of what works, but also evidence that shows where are the problems, who are the neglected groups, communities, and interventions. So aligning bilateral aid, and we have to say that in the first 10 of the first 16 countries, we have at least three bilateral donors who are bringing co-financing into the um, into the GFF and in support of the investment. And the last thing I want to uh, towards uh, women, children, and adolescents, and that is the most currently grown field where we in the GFF are working to ensure that we bring capital to countries that are struggling to uh, prevent uh, those, uh, eliminate those preventable deaths. And we work with the private sector in countries through technical collaboration, in service provision, and as I said, through private capital. The most important thing that it's a country-led or it's a country-driven model. You see in red, the first countries that joined the GFF, then you see some in black, that's the last round of countries since last year, 11 more that joined. So you'd see a total on this map in green, a total of 27 countries that have joined the GFF. And then you see dark shaded uh, countries. Those are eligible, they have demand, want to join the GFF, and that's of course where we are in the mode right now. We're trying to generate more resources for the trust fund across these 50 countries. So what have you learned from the first three years? We learned that countries can identify priority investments to achieve uh, the RMNCH, the reproductive, maternal, newborn, child, and adolescent health and nutrition outcomes. We don't need to hear more funding, colleagues. If you give countries the evidence, they will make the important choices. They will invest in family planning, in quality maternal and newborn services, and in nutrition. And we have been working with countries to really prioritize 
prioritize both of the financing reforms that has to be taken in order to finance this. We're getting more results from existing resources, and I mentioned earlier the, that how 3.3 billion of, uh, or sorry, 452 million of GFF trust funds have been linked to 3.3 billion in Ida Agra. We can talk more about that. Ida, as you know, is for low-income countries, long-term concessional. IBRD is with, uh, for countries in mid-income, it comes with interest, and that's what the DFF does. We buy down those, the interest and match it with domestic resources. Aligned external financing is really important. So 50 bilateral donors are now aligning their financing to the country's uh, investment case. As I said, we also try to do bring out what's our value add in this field of partners and investors, and that is really to strengthen the systems, to track progress, to learn and course correct. So to date, we have supported 12 countries to actually map the for the first time, actually being able to try to map out where does the money come from towards my country and my budget. And one thing that you no country would prioritize if you ask them to prioritize is uh, CRVS, Civil Registration and Vital Statistic. We're not, yeah, that's what we need to do. So that is the only area where we actually uh, tell countries, you know, here there are resources to do this so that you know your denominator, you, you know how many are born and die, and that's actually also part of our human rights agenda to, to count people who survive and die. As I said, results. So in this report that you have in front of you, we have dig deeper into four countries early joining the GFF to look at what results are we achieving where it matters most. So Tanzania is a good example. <laughs> By the way, DFID is a co-financier in, in uh, Tanzania around their um, investment case. Tanzania is one of those countries where maternal mortality has not gone down, right? So there, they, they are really trying to tailor their investments towards uh, uh, the last year's stalling of some of those critical indicators. So what's important in Tanzania is not just that outpatient care has risen in, over the last months, but what's really important is that when you rate, you try to um, uh, assess the quality of health facilities, which they do, and they use a five-star system, <coughs> countries have moved from zero to three stars performance evaluation, one uh, uh, to 22% of countries are actually rated uh, as improved quality and, and reach their three-star uh, performance rating. DRC, a country that you will know struggle with facing more many challenges, including Ebola. In spite of these constant challenges that they're facing, they are also trying to really build resilience. Uh, and uh, through the GFF and other partners, they have now a compact. You don't just come in and start to invest anywhere in anything, but you really have to look at what are the investment case, what are the priorities, and, and, and uh, the, uh, the government has a memorandum of understanding with partners. And that where you see vaccination rates going up and assisted uh, delivery also coming uh, are increasing by 14% in 18 months. And this is important because we often hear that you can improve results in you know, countries, high-performing, well-designed, performing constant, but we want to show that in fragile areas, you can also increase coverage, and you can do that with a strong results focus. If you purchase for performance, you shift from inputs to outcomes, and really you can drive change also in difficult uh, circumstances. Same with Cameroon. In the last few years, towards the end of the MDGs, maternal mortality, and, uh, inequities around maternal mortality was growing. They, what Cameroon has done is doubling its budget for women, children, and adolescent health and nutrition, and increased the number of skill or the percentage of skilled birth by 71% in those first initial set of 24 facilities in the country. Nigeria, I'm not going to talk much about since we have uh, Dr. Jibra. Commitment of domestic resources for health and turning that into actual commitment and then working together to try to see how do you actually do that? How do you make money flow to the state and government, uh, local government areas where it matters? Health is not a federal affair in Nigeria, it's a state affair, as I'm sure Dr. Shibiru will emphasize. 
Um, so I'm not going to go into details, uh, but I just tell you because you may ask what many do, which is how does the DFF actually help countries mobilize, for example, domestic resources? Well, we do that by providing technical assistance to identify the best policy options. And there are many for, for how, you, how you allocate smartly. So we work with health financing strategies to support countries who often have and a long-term health financing strategy to see how one can prioritize aspects of that, like in Ethiopia, Myanmar, Senegal, and Uganda. We look at fiscal space analysis to be enabled to see where, where, we, where you have ceiling for increasing resources. We support tax policies. So if you take DRC, we work with DRC on tobacco policy and, and uh, tobacco tax, and in Liberia on alcohol tax. So both, you know, upstream, how do we raise revenues, how do we support countries in terms of how it's spent, and how do we monitor those flows. The reason why the GFF is housed at the World Bank is because it gives us access to ministers of finance. That's the client of the bank. So by working with the bank, we can foster this dialogue between sectoral ministers, between health people, and the budget and the finance people. That's a very important piece because you cannot increase domestic resources if you don't work with ministers of finance, if you don't work with ministers of finance across sectors. It's a multi-sector sectoral dialogue. So that's one reason why it's so important for us that, that how first and link the indicator, get the, the resources use these financing instruments to ensure domestic resources. In Guatemala, uh, mid-income countries, there we said, if you're willing to address your huge inequity, the indigenous population's biggest challenge, which is stunting, if you have a stunting program and are willing to spend 100 million on that, we will buy down the loan and you match it with domestic resources and that money they achieve their goals, is then reinvested in indigenous people's reproductive, maternal, child, and, uh, and adolescent health. So those are the opportunities that we work on. Cameroon, I won't go into detail uh, around because we, you can read all the details in this report around Cameroon, Tanzania, DRC, and also Nigeria. Just to say that what's interesting is the lower bolded part of the Cameroon story is that the government is doubling its commitment to financing the health nutrition for women, children, and adolescents, 30%. Here is our approach to monitoring, which is really in the middle section, that health countries and subnationally ask the right question. Are we in the right places of the country where people are suffering the most? Are we matching uh, results with available resources? Are the, fund, the funds matching the needs, etc.? I won't go into this, and I won't go into details on the country profile, except to let you know that at the end of this results report, you will find a profile for each of the first 16 countries that shows you the investment case priorities, that shows you the RMNCHMN, Reproductive Maternal and Human Child and Adolescent Health Nutrition data, where are they uh, on coverage, which we don't generate new data, we use available data. Health finance indicators for the first time include in process outcome and impact. Clearly an area where we need to work much more together on really good core set of financing indicators. The resource mapping, you will see a chart of, of uh, where the money is coming from that they can tap into. And at the bottom, monitoring on a country-led process. This came from CSOs. <coughs> CSOs want to hold us accountable for the DFF process, not just results. So, so at the bottom there, you will see self-monitoring of the process. Is it an inclusive process, etc.? So you can get that from the country profiles. So one more minute, if I may. Um, uh, what the key lessons that we have learned is that we can mobilize additional resources, that countries can achieve rapid results. <coughs> and what's important in this group here, also that we can improve on collaboration and communications at country level. That's where we can do better than we've done to date, so that we engage all the stakeholders. So the key, key actions that we're taking is really to engage all stakeholders from the beginning of an investment case. We don't, you know, you don't develop the investment case and then knock on the door and ask people to come in, but really work 
on it together. Have someone in the country all the time that you that knows the process and can improve on communications and coordination in the government. And right now we're working on implementation guidelines with all technical partners and a source book to make sure that partners can come in with that uh, technical support at the right time. So we're here right now. We were in 27 countries. We want to move to 23 more. We are trying to raise two billion over this next year, this and next year, to be able to invest over the five years in those that have greatest demand. And let me just finish by saying this is urgent. Countries are not bending the curve on the SDGs, the maternal and newborn child mortality. Countries are not yet showing demonstration of or rapidly increasing progress on USC. We think that we have a big role to play to help countries lead those processes, define their priorities, and get, then get the financing required to actually accelerate progress. So thank you very much. Thank you, Miriam. That's really fascinating. I was struck by the example of Tanzania and the DRC, where you can actually see tangible results. Um, hopefully, we'll have the chance to discuss sustainability of this later on, mm -hmm. uh, given that this is not going to be around forever, and maintaining that momentum after the money runs out, and most importantly, after the technical support runs out, perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, will be hard. But, uh, Dr. Dubru, please. commissioners and he has been working very closely with the GFF and with the Gates Foundation uh, and hopefully you'll tell us your experiences and how your interaction with the GFF has helped what could be done better perhaps and what talk a little bit on um, the Nigerian um, health sector and um, all that is happening in Nigeria in trying to improve the life status, uh, health status of our people. My name is Dr. Mustafa Mohammed um, Jibril. Uh, I'm from Nigeria and nine justice. Nigeria has um, 36 um, states. We have a population in Nigeria of about over 200 million it is one of these 36 states that the country has been divided um, into. Niger City is in the middle uh, of Nigeria as a, as a country. We also have an additional uh, area in Nigeria, which is the capital called Abuja. So it's usually said Nigeria has 36 plus one uh, state. And most part of um, Abuja was cut out of um, Niger, uh, Niger State. Now, I'm the Commissioner for Health, as it's referred to in Niger State, which means um, I'm responsible um, to ensure that um, the 5 million people in Niger have access uh, to basic healthcare services. In Niger State is the state in Nigeria with the largest land mass. Like I said, we have a population of about 5 million um, people in Niger State. The state is further divided into what we refer to as 25 local governments, and they're further broken down into 274 uh, wards. Niger State also, because of the largest, it has a large landmass, uh, has a population kind of dispersed into a portion of 5 million people. Then we also have the highest number of hard to reach communities uh, in the state. In Nigeria, over the past um, decade, um, we've seen a decline in the health budget of the country as it relates to the overall budget of um, the country, which had a decline from 6% of the total budget of the country to about 3.7% in 2018. The uh, Abuja Declaration in Nigeria expects Nigeria to at least attribute 15% of its um, budget to health. We've not been able to achieve this. And public expenditure also in Nigeria has also been on the decline. 
um, despite the fact that um, we've been having an increase in population um, growth and an increase in inflation. And recently, Nigeria just came out of um, recession, uh, which is still a problem for the people. Um, there's been stagnation um, and reversal in some of the achievements Nigeria has had over the past few years in the reproductive maternal, newborn, and child health, adolescent health, and neonatal um, outcomes. And then there has been further increase in inequity in the distribution of um, healthcare services across the country um, by geographical um, division and also by socioeconomic status, where the poor people don't tend to get um, more um, access. In Nigeria, under the, in the health system, we're facing a lot of um, challenges as it relates to the issue of um, human resource for uh, health, low productivity from the, our human resource. We have challenges with uh, inadequate medical equipment, especially in terms of financing healthcare services. We have major challenges because most people pay for their healthcare services um, out of their um, pocket. Up to now, in recent um, times, we've had increase in maternal mortality rates in um, Nigeria, um, and also increase in the infant mortality rate and an increase in the number of deaths of under five mortality rate, probably also in line with the challenges that we've been facing. Recently in Nigeria, we've had a little bit of some security challenges in the northeastern part of the um, country, usually around about five um, states. And I think these security challenges also played a major role in ensuring that lots of funds that would have been used for other things is used in trying to curtail these um, challenges. Good it has come down, the security challenges have improved now, but it has debated our resources. So what are we doing um, as a country? In 2014, the Nigerian government, the legislature, were able to pass a new National Health um, Act. Now, this National Health Act was passed in um, 2014, trying to come up with new innovative ways of financing the health sector of um, Nigeria. Now, in this act, um, one percent of the Nigerian consolidated revenue funds and all the funds that Nigeria get is supposed to be used to finance uh, healthcare service and to provide what to, to establish what we refer to as the basic healthcare provision um, fund. Now, this basic healthcare provision fund is to support the provision of um, basic healthcare services at the primary healthcare system of the country, and then all, also the basic healthcare provision. Uh, fund as a, as a new approach is so meant to supplement what we have in the budget. Like I said, our budget has, has been coming uh, down. It took 10 years before this uh, National Health Act um, was passed in 2014. And since it was passed in 2014, it's also taken another four years now for us to begin the implementation of this part of this um, National Health um, um, Act. Due to the fact that um, we've been having, like I said, poor performance in our health um, sector, financing the health sector has always been a major um, challenge. The whole idea was that um, through this um, basic health care uh, provision fund that was established in the Act, we will see a paradigm um, shift from focusing on secondary care and tertiary care and focusing on the urban center to moving towards the primary health care um, system where funds is going to be channeled. Now, the basic health provision um, fund is divided, it's going to be broken down into several pieces. 50% of this um, fund will go into providing um, health insurance um, for the people of um, Nigeria, while the remaining 50% um, of the fund will be focused in improving our primary health care system. Because in Nigeria, over 70% of our people still access their services through the primary health care system. But this has been a system that has been neglected for so many um, years. Now, in Niger State um, specifically, uh, because of the coming of the global financing um, facility, like I said, after 2014, when this law was passed, nothing much had happened in the Nigerian health um, system to try and raise this um, fund. Now, luckily, we got um, support from the Global Financing Facility that are helping, that are going to help us now to begin to implement this provision uh, of the National Health um, um, Act. It has helped in changing the narratives in our state and has brought about discussion 
about this provision of the National um, Health um, Act. In Niger State, when well, three states were selected for this um, to be um, implemented, uh, in Niger State, it has led to the fact that um, the counterpart funding is supposed to be provided by the state government. So the Niger State government right now is providing an extra 100 million naira in order for to assess um, this um, fund. The, we have also identified 274 health facilities in Niger State um, government where we will be able to deploy the use of this fund. Um, in Niger State, we have over 1,774 primary health care facilities, and we have one secondary health care facilities for each of the local government. Now, but only about 29% of these primary health care facilities are functional. Uh, but now, through the support from the global financing and facility, we have identified in each ward at least one primary health care facility that will be providing 24 7 um, services to, to the people. And then also, the state government, um, because of um, this fund, we decided to recruit recruited <coughs> extra health care workers. We've recruited over 100 uh, nurse uh, midwives. We have also established contact with the community and set up what we refer to as ward um, health development um, committees at the local um, level attached to each of these um, facilities. And then also, we have also tried to revitalize our drug management um, um, system, drug and hospital management um, drug and hospital consumable management um, um, system as well, like, through the support from the Bill and Melinda Gates um, Foundation, who are helping Niger State to try and strengthen our primary health care uh, services. Facilities have already also been accredited in order for us to be able to provide these um, uh, services. The communities have also been mobilized. The traditional rulers, the political um, leaders have also been sensitized on the importance of ensuring that um, we are able to take healthcare services down to the, uh, to the community. Now, helping to implement um, these um, uh, reforms uh, in the state have not turned out to be easy. What we've been trying to do at the national level um, also is to draw all the state um, government uh, to discuss with the Minister for um, Health and trying to see how we're going to improve the services that get down to our uh, to the people. Like I said earlier, three states have been selected um, for the pilots of um, this um, implementation of this um, fund. I will try and stop you and try and bring it up to you to make you understand why it is um, important that we are able to, to do this. Now, in, in, in Nigeria, what tends to happen is that because most of the secondary care facilities in general South are at the urban area, so they tend to get more at more attention uh, because that is where people who end poor are staying in the country. While at the primary health care um, level, we, we do not have um, uh, people, more of the people, they are poor, rural, and then they are, they are marginalized. So what the federal government is trying to do now is to ensure that um, through the basic health provision fund, um, separate from the national budget to get funds that will be used primarily to strengthen the primary health care um, system. Now for four years this has not happened until we got some opportunity from the GFF and now we're beginning to have um, discussion and the states, three states which have been selected, one from the north which is Niger State, one, two from the south, the south is divided into two, the northeast and the northwest have also been selected and then we have also been um, challenged to begin to put in our own resources and to begin to try and do what we can so that we will be able to assess this one. And also at the national um, level, the federal government has also been able for the first time in four years to put in its budget this 1% of this consolidated revenue fund to be used for um, health. Um, but for now, the, that fund has, is yet to be um, released. But we believe that if we are able to demonstrate in our own district states that are starting this um, pilot, that this fund can be well utilized and it's going to benefit the people, that it will further encourage the Nigerian government to further release more um, funds. They've gone a long way, 10 years to set up the act, Four years now, after you know, because of the fact that they were getting a pilot from um, the, through the World Bank, um, now it has been put in the budget. What is left for us at the state level, the three states that have been selected, 
is for us to demonstrate that this font will be utilized well. One way where we are getting lessons from to the, to the development of this um, font, the World Bank through the GFF has actually supported um, some other pilots and projects in, in Nigeria through what we refer to as NSHIP, the Nigerian State Led Investment um, Project. And currently, right now, the Save One Million Life Program for Resort. In the Save One Million Life Program for Resort, every state in Nigeria got about $1.5 million um, dollars to try and improve health services at the primary health care level. And then the focus now, as, as, as proposed to before, is focused on um, results. If you do well and the indices in the country changes, then you get more um, uh, funding, as opposed to in the past where we tend to focus more on, uh, on um, inputs. I think uh, I will um, stop um, here, uh, and then if probably if there are more questions, I'll be able to give uh, more qualifications. Apologies, it's not easy talking in front of um, special uh, people like you are here. So I was a little bit um, nervous, but hopefully by the time you ask uh, more questions, I can give more clarifications. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think you've described for us what catalytic actually means, what Miriam described as catalytic. You've sketched out exactly what that means and how perhaps sometimes it's more about politics and less about money. But, uh, but we can talk about this more. So we've got three more panelists. Uh, we've got uh, uh, Kevin uh, Watkins from uh, Save the Children. We've got Joe Sorrell from the Gates Foundation. Thanks again for having us here. And we've got Claire Moran from DFID. Um, so what I will ask you to do, starting with Kevin perhaps, is take two or three minutes uh, to reflect on what you've heard um, and then we'll open up for discussion and we're running a little bit late, so please stick to two or three minutes stops. Thank okay. you. Um, throw, throw something at me in three minutes. <laughs> um, look, I, j just to start off by saying a huge thank you to Miriam and Dr. Jibril for really clear presentations. Um, and also for this report, and, uh, and I think this report captures in a nutshell why it's really critical that we get behind the GFF and make it work. And I say that, maybe I could start where Miriam left off, which is on the urgency of right. where we are. So as, as an international community, we made a commitment to end preventable child deaths by 2030. We are woefully off track for achieving that goal. There, there will be around 3 million preventable child deaths in 2030 on the current trajectory. And within that, we know there are subsets of big global challenges. So one of them is the fact that neonatal death is coming down far more slowly than one to five, uh, zero to five deaths overall. Another is that major killers, the, the biggest of them and the most neglected of them being pneumonia, are witnessing very slow progress. Um, we know that the very slow progress that's being achieved in cutting malnutrition among children is a direct factor in contributing to these avoidable deaths. And I think what the GFF is trying to do is to, is to provide an integrated solution to those problems, which is why we should welcome it. And be, because I've only got three minutes, I'm be, just to put in a nutshell, what I see is the three really big challenges that the GFF is biting off. One of them is the financing challenge. And money's not everything, but when you have a $33 billion a year financing hole in the budgets that are needed to deliver the interventions, it sure as hell slows the pace of progress. Um, second is health system weakness exacerbated in many cases by problems in donor coordination and coordination between finance, finance ministries um, and health ministries. And arguably the biggest one of all, inequality. You know, we know that death rates for the poorest are coming up far more slowly than they are for the wealthiest. We know if you take a country like um, Kenya, the, the difference in per capita spending ranges from $4 per capita in some of the poorest districts to $40 in some of the wealthiest. So you know, these are big inbuilt financing inequities that are driving those wider inequalities uh, and holding back the development of, of systems. I, I think Miriam and Jibril have set out really clearly how and why this mechanism can fix some of those problems in areas like uh, coordination, like the leveraging of either uh, IBRD, 
uh, the fact that a fifth of the budget is geared towards nutrition, I think, is uh, overwhelmingly welcome. And in the minute that I've got left, uh, because I'm from the C uh, CSO, you would expect me to say something a little disruptive, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, which I'll, I'll try to do. So for, first of all, I, I think to take the GFF to the next level, we have to start holding governments to account for making the financing commitments that were implicit in what they said they would do under the SDGs, the 2030 development goals, to end preventable child deaths. If you spend 1% of GDP on health, you are not serious in your intent to achieve the goals. And I think it's really important that the GFO should systematically publish the data on government performances in that area. Um, secondly, if the, the, this report opens with a really good section on leaving no one behind. And leaving no one behind is like the American Constitution. Right? You know, it's motherhood and apple pie and we all want to do the right thing. Leaving no one behind is about closing the gaps in death rates, and in financing between the richest and the poorest parts of the country. I think the GFF should be systematically publishing data on the pace of convergence in those areas. Because of the relationship with the World Bank, I think there are really big opportunities to leverage the public expenditure reviews that the World Bank uh, are already conducting to oversee what's happening and, and to track performance in those areas. Uh, as, as one example of fighting of some of the big issues, Miriam gave the example of the tobacco tax in DRC, which I am we I am critically support and say the children does as well. That is small beer compared to the wholesale theft of money through the mining concessions in the DRC, channeled through the British Virgin Islands. So you know if we want if we want to tackle these big you know Nigeria has many of the same challenges of course as, as well. So I think you know, we have to tackle these bigger corruption um, and taxation issues. The, the one actor that hasn't been very present in a lot of discussion is the IMF. And if we're talking about fiscal space, IMF programs continue to play a really critical role in determining what the fiscal space is for governments. So I thought that, I think that should be brought into the frame signal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll skip you, Joe. May I go to Claire first, and as the host, perhaps you go next. Um, thank you. Um, well, firstly, um, yeah, thank you for inviting me here and uh, really interesting to hear the, the other speakers. I was just, just going to say a little bit in terms of um, what the UK government sees as the strength of the GFF and kind of what the things that we like and a little bit about how we've been involved to date. Um, so I think in terms of the strength, they really are the things that Mariam laid out in her presentation. Um, you know, so firstly, as Kevin said, these are really critical of track SDGs and they are really high importance to the UK government. So actually have a mechanism that is focused on them in an integrated way that wants to take results to scale is absolutely essential for us. Um, and I think like Kevin said, we're very conscious that in terms of the effectiveness and impact of, of donor aid over the years, we all know, uh, you know it has been quite fragmented, quite inefficient, duplicate. So to have a mechanism that aims to put government in the driving seat, to align behind national priorities, to do so in a way that is integrated, based on evidence and results, and then to try and take that to scale in a way that is coordinated and integrated um, is a real strength for us. Um, likewise, I think the fact that it isn't just focused on the outcomes, it's, it's also focused on some of the underlying driving factors, so looking at WASH, education, nutrition, family planning, trying to take a really integrated subsector approach. And we know that that's really difficult, uh, but it's a really worthwhile thing to do. I think also for us, the UK government has a really strong emphasis trying to strengthen um, health systems to achieve greater universal health coverage. So the fact that that is really embedded in the GFF. Uh, and I think for me, the thing that's sort of been personally interesting in sitting on the investors group is really hearing the feedback from partner countries um, so you, you, you hear mixed feedback from a range of stakeholders on the GFF, but if you ask ministries of health, they like it. Uh, and I think for us, securing a sort of stronger partner country commitment is also absolutely key. And we've heard our Secretary of State talk about a desire to kind of reward the countries that invest in their own people and being able to give our taxpayers that assurance. 
So for us, the fact that the GFF places that dialogue right at the centre and has secured some impressive results in terms of kind of partner country commitments uh, is really essential. I was just going to say briefly, there's one thing where there's a bit of a myth around kind of how, how, how DFID and the UK has been involved in the GFF, and I did want to reassure people, we have really been at the table and been actively engaged right from the outset. Uh, it's not always something that is seen and noticed, but Mary will know that we're kind of there in meetings at the end of the phone. Uh, so for us, kind of being there from the start, being a, we call ourselves a critical friend, uh, trying to shape and engage has been really essential. Uh, and we were really pleased that we were able to kind of increase the contribution we made to the GFF during the family planning summit in 2017. Uh, so for us, we made a new £30 million commitment uh, and particularly wanting to support uh, the kind of innovative private sector catalytic bits of the GFF. Um, and I was also really delighted to hear from Dr. Jabril, uh, because for us, I think Nigeria is one of the really interesting examples of how uh, it's been able to integrate in private sector service provision and look at really coming behind um, the Nigerian plan. Uh, so I think I'll finish there. Very happy to take questions. Thank you. John. Great. I'm not sure what, how much there's left to be said. <laughs> We've heard a lot about the GFF, why I think it's uh, great value. Some of the early results is already uh, demonstrating in, in a pretty short period of time. Um, so I'll try not to be too redundant. I, in reflecting, I, I thought I'd tell a short story, and that's about 2008. So about 10 years ago, I had an opportunity as part of the Gates Foundation delegation, uh, our global health team, I had a chance to go to Mozambique. And we launched uh, a malaria program there. And on the back end of, of that trip, we're invited by uh, a Canadian, the Canadian mission there, uh, based in Maputo, to, uh, to sit with amongst a number of other donors that were working in, in Mozambique. There's probably six or eight around the table, and there was a, a spirited discussion about uh, why donors couldn't work more closely together to align funding against a single country plan, and how efficient that would be, and how much, uh, you know, how much better you know, uh, some of the, the impact of those resources would go if, if, uh, if donors could, could be more coordinated. Uh, and, and this quest in, in, the, in that decade since, I think, has continued about how to strengthen some of the coordination at the country level, uh, which is why I, I think the GFF uh, really presents a great opportunity to uh, bring that much needed coordination and coherence uh, to, to plans. Um, and I think in a, at a time when uh, donor flows are really under threat, the fiscal pressures are really challenging, uh, it's, it's a time, it's, a, it's an idea that's well past its time and we really need to, to get on board and figure out how to make it, how to make it work. Uh, so it was in that spirit that when the Norwegian government came to us and uh, requested that the foundation come in as a, as a supporter of the GFF, uh, we, were, we were very excited. Obviously the, the, the mission of trying to support uh, women's adolescent child health gets to the very core of what the Gates Foundation was all about. But it was really the approach that the GFF was, uh, was taking that, uh, that excited us even, even more. And again, the idea of trying to align donor funding, whether that's from multilateral organizations, uh, bilateral donors, foundation funding, against single country plans developed by the countries themselves that reflected the, the priorities at the national level, uh, that really distinguished the, the GFF uh, from, from other uh, institutions. And it was something that, that uh, very much appealed to us. Um, uh, similarly, I think it's, it's you know, putting data and measurement at the heart of everything that it does, which the GFF uh, does, is, is something that, that, um, that, that we obviously like very much. We are a data-driven organization. We like analytics, and we really were impressed by the way that uh, the GFF was, was uh, and is carrying out its mission. Um, and it's, you know, it's evidence in this report now that, again, in a pretty short period of time, the, the GFF is already showing some great results, uh, and the model is really proving out the, uh, the evidence from countries like Tanzania and others that Miriam presented are really impressive and, and should give uh, donors um, great confidence that, that uh, uh, a mechanism like the GFF really can be additive to, to the global health architecture. So it it's, uh, was based on uh, both the early promise but um, also some of the results that the foundation agreed in, in, uh, 
uh, last year to, uh, to contribute $200 million to support uh, the GFF and, um, and why uh, Melinda Gates and the Gates Foundation have agreed to co-host in Oslo on November 6th of a punishment um, that uh, we, we certainly hope there's going to be a, a lot of interest in, and, uh, and commitments to brought to bear on. I'll say just lastly that uh, we often get the question, GFF is yet another mechanism in an already crowded global health architecture. How do we, how do we make sense of all of these organizations? And I think the one thing to, to keep in mind is that the, that the GFF is not competing uh, with organizations like the Global Fund or, or Gavi. Uh, I think at its, at its best, the GFF can really help some of those organizations and bilateral funding from, from donors be better, be better coordinated, be more coherent, and really reflect uh, what those national plans are. Uh, and as, as organizations like Gavi and, and the Global Fund are, are thinking about and actively um, supporting health system strengthening, they can do that with better intelligence and a better sense of what really is, uh, what really are the priorities of, of, of those countries in, in, in that regard. So uh, we think that the GFF is a valuable addition to the global health architecture and something that really uh, will be something you know, very additive and, and important. So lastly, again, uh, I, you know, in, in, uh, the GFF is very brave in this time period, both to launch a mechanism, but have uh, as, a, as a goal $2 billion to, to raise over the next uh, five years. Uh, it's, it's ambitious and, and bold, and, and we really do need uh, the help uh, of, of donors and, and, and many of you in this room to help make the case why the GFF really does uh, deserve uh, uh, the support. I think. You know, Prime Minister May and, and several other European leaders, when they uh, have been in Africa recently, all talked about uh, aid uh, really needing to uh, be based more on a, uh, a principle of self-reliance and, and equal partnership. And I think it's exactly that spirit that uh, the GFF brings to bear. So I, I, I hope and, and hope well, we can count on you to uh, make sure that donors come and come with, uh, with strong commitments on November 6. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So. Uh We've got about 30 minutes, perhaps a bit less, for questions. Um, if you can tell us who you are, where you come from. I've oh, got a microphone. Yes. Um, please, over to you. Yes. Do you want me to take it off? Yeah. Um, hi there, my name is Andrew Storey from CHAI, the Clinton Health Access Initiative. <coughs> I actually have two questions if I can, both from Maria. Um, first of all, um, one of my takeaways from Dr. Gibri's um, great talk earlier, I think was the emphasis on um, extending the health system to the community level. You made that point several times, and I think I'm right in saying that in the states, a very high proportion of births occur outside the health facility, 70 or 80 percent, maybe, I'm not, you, know, you can tell me, but you know, so that means the majority of births are happening outside you know, at the other city, at the home, in the village. And yes, it's great that you have these initiatives to, ex to you know, really do something about that, to extend that. So, Mary, I was wondering, is that an approach that's been replicated in other countries? Is that a, a lesson that's been brought from Nigeria, from Pride elsewhere, where I know other countries also have a very high proportion of births happening outside the health facility? And then, secondly, just going to Kevin's words earlier about um, ensuring that no one's left behind. One thing I noticed is there's no mention of stillbirths. And I was wondering, do you consider stillbirths to be out of scope for the GFF? Thank you. Thank you. I think I need to borrow this. Yeah. Thank you so much for those two very, for those two very important questions. Uh, the first one around the uh, community health systems. You know, we even want to take it a step further. We often talk in the, with countries about the front line first, that we cannot continue to have a system by which things eventually trickle out to communities, but we're really trying to shift the paradigm and start investing in those communities that are left behind. And that is why when we talk about the development of investment case, it's not just asking what's the burden of disease and conditions, but where do they happen? And, uh, and in which age group, early years, adolescents, which are the neglected interventions around quality, for example, maternal legal health. So you will see, if you look across the geographies, the 60 fertile countries, they are almost all steered towards the hard to reach area. Cameroon, northwest. 
Mozambique, there are some areas in the middle that are greatly challenged. So this is not replication, but each country discovers this for themselves. So great. The other thing is, yes, we do count stillbirth very much so. And you will soon see a report coming out from us where we are reporting on what can the GFF do. If we succeed in getting the, raise the two billion, how much can we, through the various leverage, how much money can we actually mobilize? How much further can that take in terms of coverage? And how many deaths can we can we save, both in mothers, children, newborns, and stillbirths? So thank you. It's very much part of it. And as you know, very important part of the whole quality of care and early interactions. Thanks. Yes, please. Uh, my name is Oike Anya. I'm from Nigeria Health Watch. Um, and my question is um, to Dr. Jibril, but also to uh, the rest of the panel. Um, it has two aspects. The first is in relation to um, the frequent strikes in the Nigerian health sector and how that may impact on the focus on um, public sector health facilities. And um, we know that even at the um, bottom of the pyramid in Nigeria, there is quite extensive use of private health care. Um, and whether that's being taken into account at all. Um, the second um, question is, Nigeria Health Watch, we try to make um, health issues um, easier for the average person in Nigeria to understand. And I wondered what, in relation to GFF, you'd like our message um, to be um, to the Nigerian public. Thank you. Okay, thank you um, very much. Uh, how to approach your questions. Um, first and foremost, I was just um, just trying to, in a quick manner to, be, to say, to summarize what I tried to say um, today. Now, Nigeria contributes um, one of the highest burden of um, disease, both maternal death, child death in the whole world. Now, Nigeria uh, is a place where you have um, the second highest number of women um, dying um, when they give um, birth. Our routine immunization is low. Only 20% of um, children have access to routine um, immunization in the, in, the, in the whole country. In my own state, just 13% um, percent of, um, uh, of children. Also, in terms of nutrition, over 50% uh, from the recent um, uh, study that was done in 2016, the multiple cluster study that was done, over 50% of Nigerian children uh, are stunted. Now, the challenge that we face in trying to reverse some of these challenges um, we have in the, in the Nigerian um, health system is that, like I said, we are faced with other problems, the issue of um, knowledge, the issue of number of people that are actually educated. I'll give um, two examples. Um, one is that um, as a commissioner for health in Niger State, uh, my governor, um, after two years uh, at the helm of affairs, went around all the communities to see the work that he is doing to discuss with the people, to see if he has been reaching out to them as they want, and to find out from them what do they actually want. Now, I remember at one community in Muye, in the Niger State, when the Emir was listing out some of their challenges and what their problems um, were, um, he, he said that they have problems of um, light, that they want light, they want some road, they want water, they want fertilizer for their agriculture. And then the governor turned to me and said, uh, Mustafa, they don't want you. Then he said, ah, well, why don't you want health? And when he said that, um, the Emir turned and looked at um, one of the local person in visit, and he says, yeah, we really want health, but uh, he's already providing um, some of the health and status. And then one thing also they mentioned was mocks, and the place for prayer and worship. So he now said that um, they have a person who is providing those um, um, services, and then also that they have a mosque that where they will go and pray when people um, fall um, uh, fall uh, ill. Now so that's one of the challenges that we face in our country: that the fact that people's awareness about um, how to even care for themselves. However, if we if we have a proven intervention that when you bring to the to the people, they are obvious. For example, malaria. Malaria got its name in, in the word malaria because at the time that the, uh, the, um, the colonial, those who colonized us came into Nigeria, they thought that malaria was caused by bad air. Now, over time, it was proven that it's not mal air, which is bad air, that's what it got to be malaria, that was caused by um, mosquitoes. Now, if we deliver those services to the people at the community level, that will go a long way in helping. The second thing I want to also um, mention is that this, so those services do not reach down to the community level. 
Now the second thing is that uh, about three months um, ago, I'm the only son of my mother. I'm the firstborn, and I have five younger um, sisters. Um, four of them are married. Only one person is not married. Now, one of my major challenges when my to fulfill life, you have to get married. You have to give birth to children. I'm a medical doctor. I'm responsible for the health of everyone in Niger State. My younger sister, two months um, ago, one of my younger sisters, her first pregnancy, she just got married recently. She was in Kaduna, one of the states in the country. She was eight months pregnant, and she started having severe um, headache. So they went into one of the general um, hospitals with her husband. And when they got there, because the headache was so severe, um, he wanted to go home to get some funds, but he said, okay, let, her take, let me take her to the hospital. When he took her to the hospital, they took her blood pressure. Her blood pressure was about two, above 200. 200 something. So the doctor told her that the person who saw her that this is very, very severe, that she would have to be admitted. So he said, okay, fine. But the next problem was that he didn't have money in his hand. So the person refused and said that he wasn't going to take her, that she, they can go home quickly and get some um, um, funds and they let her let them bring her um, back. Then he, the husband tried to beg. He said, oh no, the challenge is that like most Nigerians, if that's what happened, they will beg. And then when you admit the person, they will still come and tell that they don't have um, funds and that hospital needs to run. So he left with my younger sister and then went home and got his uh, card, ATM card, to go to the bank machine to, to withdraw money. Now, while he was withdrawing money, when he came back to the car, he met my younger sister convulsing. Um, she had gone into um, eclampsia. So he became confused and he rushed out to the hospital. He dislocated her shoulder while he took her to the hospital. Um, she was in coma for um, three days. And before they, when they called me in Mina and they told me that um, I actually thought that she was going to um, die because my mom called me, my mom was worried. I was in Abuja then and she said I should quickly start going down to Kaduna. But I told her that um, I'm almost sure that she's going to find it difficult to, um, to make it. But we're lucky, she's um, okay now. She gave back to a premature um, child. The child is also okay. But what am I trying to draw here? Now, one of the major challenges is that most of our financing for health is out of pocket. When you go to receive health care, you don't know when a health emergency will strike. When you go to receive health care and you don't have money in your pocket, at that time, you would no, not get um, um, services. Now, how is this uh, GFF going to um, help us? Now, I, I said something that Nigeria, the health budget, even in my states, at the state level, in Niger state, uh, we've been able to increase our budget because my governor's um, wife is also a medical doctor and, and a gynecologist, and he honest, because of that, he has increased the state budget from 6% to 9%, now to 11% of the overall total budget. However, the release for the funds of the budget is very um, low. Uh, last year, only 20% was released. Now, the question now comes, when we release this, when we release this 20%, even at the national level, uh, the budget is there, but the release will just be about 30%. Now, when they release this 30%, where does it go to? Now, the Nigerian healthcare system is like in a state of war. When you are in a state of war, people are, are, are dying at, at that moment. So you don't have time to start thinking about, you want to deal with the present complaints because those who are ill, severely ill and about to die would not give you a breathing space. So you want, you want to focus on this, on taking care of them and you want to talk about pre what are the steps that you will take to prevent them from getting this, to this situation. If they have access, they will have been um, prevented from getting to that um, situation. So most of the funding that comes into over 70% of our resources that comes into the health sector go straight to dealing with people at the secondary care level that are already having challenges. And that's why the primary health care system had been neglected. Now, the National Health Act came in and realized that, okay, what we will do is that we will allocate 1% of all the money that is coming to Nigeria to take care of primary health care, um, uh, uh, primary health care system as kind of like a new mechanism. Now, if you allocate money, nobody will say, this is a separate money that's coming, the money that is outside of the normal budgetary allocation. So that was done in 2014, but there was still no um, backing of um, funding because there are lots of challenges of whether if you push this fund to the health sector, how will they make use of um, it? Then came the GFF. Now, how has the GFF um, helped? Now, they came in and they said, okay, after four years now, that we can help you provide funds to operationalize this um, basic health care provision fund. Now, to kind of like give a proof of concept, now, if they give, if by this fund that they have put in place um, now is separate from that of the, of the health budget. And then the question now comes, how are we going to utilize this fund? Now, luckily in Nigeria, the GFF have been able to support what I refer to as the Nigerian um, Health 
um, Nigerian State Health Investment Project in three states, Nasarawa, Adama State, and Ondo State. And I will come to answering your own um, the question that you asked. Now, in this process, the funds are sent directly to the facility level. Now, and then I will also answer the question of the community. Most of the, the primary health care system in Nigeria, we do not have doctors mainly there. We have community health extension workers and the midwives. Their mandate is to go into the community and provide outreach services. But they do not have logistics for these services and um, they don't have operational um, funds. They don't even have basic equipment to work with, to even go in and provide these services. Now, through the endship program that is taking place in these three states, funds were sent directly to the facilities where they'll be utilized. They'll use the funds to carry out outreach to the community and educate the community that people will come in. Now, I will say this um, here uh, a little bit painfully that in, in Niger State, Niger State is a state with the second highest number of newborn deaths in the whole um, country. Now, Adamawa State, which is also a state in the north, has moved from being almost close to Niger State now. I think because of these um, funds that they are sent directly to the facilities, have now become the second best state in the country in terms of newborn um, uh, newborn death. So what we are doing now, and what the GFF is funding, what we're happy about the GFF, and I told them that I wouldn't be here unless I'm happy about what they are trying to do. One, they identify a solution in the policy of Nigeria in trying to identify we want to separate funds that will go straight to the primary healthcare system and to the communities. And now they intend to support that process. Then secondly, they already have a proof of concept of in some areas where they have worked using the ship that when funds are seeking, all of us are making a sacrifice in the country because of the issue of accountability and corruption, which he talks about. Now, these funds, even when the federal government releases this one, but currently now we're through the GFF fund, the funds are going to buy court so many normal bureaucratic bottlenecks that we tend to have. It's going to buy court the national level. It's going to buy court me as a state um, level. And the fund is going to be going straight to the, to the facilities where the problems are, straight to the communities where it is. Now, it took some time before, but because we know that um, this is what is needed by the people, so the effect is going to be very, very high. So that's why the, the fund is going straight to facilities. So that will take care of is issues of corruption as long as, and because usually it's when it passes through various um, um, stages that we tend to have um, um, challenges. So this will help with the issues of them, the communities and even the steel beds that we are talking about. Then lastly, just quickly, just to answer the question that my <laughs> brother um, asked. He asked the question of the issue of um, recurrent um, strikes and the place of um, primary and uh, um, private um, health um, facilities. Now, the issue of strike is usually happens for two main reasons. One, our healthcare workers are not paid um, the right amount of money that they are supposed to be uh, um, paid. And then secondly, there is a challenge between doctors, nurses, and pharmacists in the health sector. I will use my state as an a, a example. That the last recent strike that took place in Nigeria, where all the health workers went on strike, they called themselves Joint Health Workers Union, Yogesu. Now, Niger State was one of the four states that were exempted from this um, strike. Niger State, UB State, um, Lagos um, State, and Kanu State. The reason being that Niger State um, government is paying the healthcare workers 100% of their entitlement. Most, all others, apart from these four states in the country, all other states in the country are paying just 70% of the health workers' um, entitlement. And Niger State is paying not just for the doctors, but across all the health um, care um, workers. And that's the reason why we were exempted from this strike. So if state governments, national governments, live up to their responsibilities and give people their entitlement, now there won't be a um, uh, strike. For the private health care, yes, private health care also have members are also going to be involved in what we are going to be um, doing. Accreditations of our facilities will be done, both private and public will be taken into cognizance under the operationalization of this basic healthcare provision um, fund. My last statement that I would, I would like to add, please, because I'm not taking so much of your time, is that because, like I said, GFF had, identif had done two things in the state, the second thing I didn't say in the state, one is that they have worked in sending funds directly to the facility. Secondly, through the support that they were given to the Save One Million Life Program for Results. Now, this is a performance-based finances, not focused on input, what you have bought, but focus on outcomes and focus on results. If the statistics in your state begin to 
um, change, the indices in your state begin to change, your maternal mortality rate and so are reducing, they, then you get more funding. Now, these two systems is going to be used in operationalizing these uh, basic energy provision funds. The fund that the GFM is going to be given that is going to be utilized in three states. And it's a, it's a unique thing, as opposed to all that with all the funding that's been taking place, like you mentioned, that they are still very important, the global fund, um, all that is taking place in the country, they focus more on certain programs, trying to eliminate malaria, trying to reduce HIV, um, AIDS uh, prevalence, and so on and so forth. However, the GFF fund this time around is targeted at provision of basic minimum um, package of health services to everybody. So all the basic causes challenges are, is going to be supported. So this is going to strengthen our healthcare um, um, system. Now, while we in our states are also very lucky that we ha also have the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, supporting us now to strengthen our primary healthcare um, system. And this fund has, like I said, has led, could have become more like a catalyst to make the states that are involved, and even the states that are not also involved, are beginning to prepare. Okay, in order for you to get this fund, you must strengthen your primary healthcare system. You must. We have supplied basic equipment to all the primary healthcare centers. We have made them to open accounts. We are involving communities. The community um, will be part of the people to make use of these um, funds. Now, so if this process is supported, and if the GFF has get more funds able to scale this up to the country, I think this is one thing that will revolutionize um, the health um, implementation of our health services and programs in the country. Because this will give us an opportunity to be able to focus on where the problem um, is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I wish we had more time because these are exactly the kinds of example we need. Uh, but I wanted, perhaps we can take a round of questions and then, please. Hi, my name is Lorraine Robinson. I'm from the One Campaign. Um, thank you so much for those comments, and it was great to hear everyone's thoughts about um, some of the real positives and advantages of the GFF to date. And so, just looking ahead to the next five years, uh, it would be great to hear um, from the panel what um, the one or two areas where you'd like to see the GFF particularly focus. Another question. Thank you very much uh, to the panel for the very interesting uh, presentation and discussion. My name is Elisabeth Taurino. I am a research fellow at Imperial College London. Um, I really like your mentioning uh, of uh, intersectoral collaboration between finance and health. So based on that, I was wondering uh, if you could talk a little bit more about um, involving in this conversation other ministries, for instance, education, as a lot of um, the health expenditure for children and adolescents actually pass through the, the budgets of the education ministries, but also gender or other social protection uh, ministries. So both in general and also in Nigeria, as I know that school ministries have been recently uh, expanded to the world of the country. So I was wondering about that. Thank you so much. One more, perhaps? Just a quick comment. Um, uh, Nigeria. Just to mention that uh, the National Health Act that Dr. Jibril is talking about, the way it galvanized several partners, including one campaign, I think it's a story that must be told. You know, and second, the fact that a meager twenty million dollars changed the conversation. This was an act signed in twenty fourteen. Why was it implemented in twenty eighteen? Because the Minister of Health in Nigeria said, you know what? Out of the forty million, let's even use twenty million. That in itself was a game changer. And I think, again, it's a story that needs to be told also. The last point to mention is Nigeria's got a large private sector providing care, in fact, mostly to poor people. For the first time now, we're going to use this approach to leverage and harness the private sector, private provider, to deliver basic services. But they're not just going to show up. Of course, they go through accreditation and all of that. So, and and I think this is pretty much transformational. And uh, we perhaps if the panel or someone on the panel can also maybe shed some more light in how the private sector is also further engaged uh, in this. Uh, 
Uh, thanks very much, Adam, for waiting from Crown Agents. Um, it's really good to hear about the uh, aspirations for GFS to try and build better coordination and streamlining of assistance to the health sector. Of course, it's not the first time that we've tried this. Joe talked about being in Mozambique in 2008 um, and the fact that this was then an opportunity to bring things together. I've already been there for three years in a group of 14 donors in the health sector trying to work around one plan, one budget, one results mechanism, one financing framework. How are we going to learn the lessons of what failed last time so that we get it right this time? Thank you. So the next <coughs> big thing from your perspective for the GFF, intersectoral uh, ministries of education, collaboration, the role of the private sector, and learning the lessons. Please, Just for, to, to that last question, I think they're learning because the Mozambique is interesting. Partners disappeared and they are coming back now. And why are they coming back? They're coming back because this time around, there's an enormous focus on governance and accountability around and, and the budget, that there is one national budget, as was mentioned, which is transparent and where you can actually see. Here's where, where our financing is coming out. We don't allow for fungibility and shifts. So it's a very interesting story, and we describe that a little bit here. Uh, I can combine uh, one response to all the questions. Going forward, clearly, we want to ensure that that partnership collaboration at the country level that we really strengthen that and that everybody is meaningful, more meaningfully engaged from the very beginning in that process. Nigeria is one of the best practices in terms of CSO's early engagement and, and so on. We would like to see, make sure that we, that happens going forward. And GFF is a multi-sector um, trust fund. So how can we indeed, as many of you said, really put investments in some of those key critical drivers for, for example, for adolescent reproductive health or early years. And I want to just give one example. Bangladesh, a $500 million education project. There were even smaller GFF catalytic financing of 15 million. What those small amounts could do was to say, we are not just interested in how many girls enroll in secondary school, we want to know how many girls finish secondary school. And girls drop out of education because the schools don't have sanitary or hygiene facilities. So there, our financing to the government is going into more gender sensitive schools where girls can actually complete their schooling, where there is a bathroom, a toilet to go to. So high emphasis and also mental health support from around bullying and all those key factors that, uh, you know, create, trigger dropout rates, which then can reduce, you know, early pregnancies and marriages. So really getting to those social drivers we think is really important going forward and doing more of that, using that potential. Thank you. Thank you. Shall I go the other? Uh, thank you. Well, just... Um, a few and not wanting to repeat what others have said. So um, I, I think one really critical area, I mean, Mir Miriam's given a really good example of schools and the best way of keeping girls out of early marriage and early pregnancy, or well, one of the best ways, of course, is keeping them in school and developing interventions to do that. I, I would also say that malnutrition is such a pervasive background risk problem across many of these areas that if we can't accelerate progress on malnutrition, our prospects for achieving a lot of the goals that the GFF is aspiring to will be compromised. I, I, I do think, as, as I've already said, that this, you know, the, the really, there's a lot of leveraging, as, as Miriam and Dr. Gibril have said, that can be done through either through IVRD and other mechanisms. The, the, the really big leveraging is through the tax system. And, you know, I, I think it's a harsh reality that health people don't speak enough about taxation, if I'm honest. You know, that it, if a country is raising 12% of GDP in revenue, it will never meet the goals that are being set in this document and elsewhere. So we, we have to make taxation the central part of this discussion. And we have to make equity in public spending. The central part of the discussion. You know, if you looked at a, a per capita public spending map of most of the countries that we're talking about, what you would find would be an almost directly inverse relationship between need, as indicated by access to health facilities, maternal mortality, child mortality, and the level of spending. Now, here, that, that is a fundamental inequality that is preventing us from getting to where we need to get. On the uh, 2030 goals, um, I, I don't want to go into the um, 
you know, there are many areas where I think the private sector could be more effectively deployed, and some areas that I, I think clearly have to be delineated as a public sector responsibility. What, one of the areas that I'm really struck by is oxygen provision. Um, you know, when, when we think of oxygen supply here in the UK, you know, you think of big teaching hospitals and those massive plants, and then hundreds of kilometres of piping around them. Now, you, you know, the, the, the truth is that many of the big health challenges that are being addressed here are challenges that require operas, like, you know, if you think of childbirth, if you think of sepsis, if you think of meningitis, if you think of pneumonia. Um, and yet we, we don't have private sectors that are being galvanized to deploy the sort of technology that are now available, oxygen concentrators, for example, in the ways that they could and should be. So I, I, I would like us to um, be looking a little bit more at that as we go ahead. Thank you. Thanks. John Clegg, perhaps you'd like to talk a little bit about private sector taxation and how does this address this? You have a very broad remit of course, poverty reduction is not just about health. Um, would you like to comment? Yeah, I was going to pick up on. Um, well, certainly, uh, I mean, local market state that, that strengthening the tax base is a new and growing priority. So certainly watch that space from ours. I was going to just pick up, I guess, on uh, Lorianne's question in the next five years. So for us, you know, we really hope the GFF is going to have a really successful replenishment that allows it to grow and expand and have the impact at scale that they're looking for. Uh, and particularly to meet that kind of unmet demand from countries that want their investments and, and aren't yet able to tap into it. And then I would echo Mariam in saying, in terms of the area of kind of foremost improvement for us is still the coordination piece, and it's probably because it's the hardest piece. So really seeing a kind of step change in the intensity and feedback and success levels around that. And I would also uh, echo Kevin I think another area for us is around nutrition. And we should say this with some humility, knowing that kind of structurally, there are issues within many countries about how nutrition is integrated into health systems and services. And it's something that we think if they were looking at um, and, and asking our partners around it too, so kind of making that meaningful to then deliver some, you know, a stronger integrated package of investments on nutrition. Uh, would be a huge result if that could be achieved over the next five years. Uh, and then on Paul's question on lessons learned and getting it right, I think for Gifford it's just really making sure that, you know, yes, we've all been talking the talk about coordination and working on it and not pressing buttons that are at it. So I think for us it's just really tailoring it to every country, getting the feedback, making what we do based on that feedback and evidence. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up maybe on, on, on my wish for the uh, for the GFF, and and I'd say, you know, in part, I, I feel like the GFF provides ministers of health with a lot of um, added firepower to be working with finance ministries to make the case for why investments in the health sector are so vital. If health ministers can come with access to uh, to additional funding from the GFF trust fund linked to IDA funding. Uh, on the condition of, of increasing domestic resources, it really does strengthen the hand of those uh, ministries of, of health to uh, to get the finance ministries to uh, relax a little on the purse strings and and uh, and spend more on a sector that we know is, is vital uh, to increase human capital to increase uh, the health and well-being of populations. Right. Well, thank you all very much. I'll pass on to you, Mary, to uh, to close us out just uh, thank you on behalf of CGD. And again, thanks to the foundation for hosting us. Uh, please, may I just say just one? Yes, please. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. <laughs> We've got about um, a minute. Yes. A couple of I minutes. think he has um, summarized um, everything, the issue of the additional um, fire power and something to negotiate, negotiate to ensure that we are stimulated to put our resources where we are supposed to. But lastly, I'll say that when I was um, going to my, my, my place where I stayed, near Trafalgar Square, I saw an edifice of, um, of a lady um, there. Um, Edith Cavell, and I was wondering what a female um, statue um, was doing because we males always think that we are the ones in social. I went and googled um, about her, and I found out that she was saving, showed, showed that she was helping people, she was a nurse who was helping people. And I came across one quote um, of hers, uh, which is the last thing that I want to say here. She said, um, I can't stop while there are lives to be saved. 
Um, I'm hoping that um, he supports that um, everyone of these giving to the GFF, I uh, assure you that it's going to go a long way in helping our countries. Um, I hope that um, what we'll see when we leave here is exactly what Eddie Cavell said, and we'll see we can't stop while there are lives to be saved. Thank you. Thank you. I think you made the perfect closing pitch. <laughs> so after that, there's very little I can say except to say that, we'll echo what many have said here, it's very ambitious, but it can be done. But as very obviously, GFF is a partnership model. It's a partnership. It can only be done in partnership with CSOs, the NGOs who are present, and the private sector that is present in Boko Haram areas. And if you work with them and you pay for performance and they perform, then a huge gains can be made. So it is about getting the best of all of us, the government, government leadership, bilateral partners, multilateral institutions. It's about culture change. And it's about thinking differently about country-driven, country-led investments in, in the survival and the thrival. <laughs> of those who survive. So thank you all very much. And I'm glad that you brought up nutrition, which for us is an integral part of this. But the beauty of the country-led um, and country-driven uh, prioritization is that nutrition isn't forgotten when, when you do, when you allow countries to prioritize. Family planning will be there. Quality maternal and newborn services will be there. And nutrition, because those are the three most neglected areas. So thank you. Thank you, thank you for sharing us. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.